Welcome to the Entrepreneur Motivation Podcast. I'm your host, Chris Bello, and today we've got Amanda Filippelli on the show. Amanda, welcome. Hi, thanks for having me. Great to have you here. We recently connected on another podcast where it was like a roundtable group discussion format. And so I thought it would be great to connect again and just share your story with my audience because we extracted a lot of gems in that in terms of mindset and overcoming challenges. But why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself real quick for the audience? Sure. So I'm Amanda. I work as a writer, editor, book coach, um, but I also come from the field of mental health. I worked in mental health care for about 10 years beforehand and during this. I've run a couple different entrepreneurial ventures. Um, My first business was actually a different kind of coaching business altogether, where I helped kids who were transitioning out of the mental health care space um, and out of treatment. Um, so it was a counseling service for kids and families um, and at youth or at risk youth. And that has kind of parlayed into the publishing industry in a weird roundabout way. Um, <laughs> and after that, I co-owned a publishing press for some time. And now I just kind of solopreneur with this coaching and editing business. Very cool. Very cool. And I know I kind of hinted at it there where there were some moments in your life where people were like, oh, you can't make a living doing this, what you want to do. And of course, that's a limiting belief that you broke through. So we can dive into all of that. But welcome once again. Thanks for uh, for introducing yourself and for your time today. And um, I guess let's let's take it in any direction. What was the challenging part that you faced whenever people told you? Did you mention, I can't remember on that podcast, did you say it was your parents who were kind of doubtful that you could make this work or like a big influence in your life? Was it something like that? Yeah. So, I mean, it was everybody. It was, it's a society problem when you're creative. Um, Growing up, like I was always a writer, even as a little kid, I used to constantly write. I penned my first novella at eight. Um, So like I couldn't stop writing all the time. Um, but growing up, everybody constantly told me that I needed to have a backup plan, um, that if I wanted to be a writer, you know, I was going to be this kind of cliche that I was going to like be penniless. Um, yeah, yeah, the starving artist. Right. So I got this idea in my head, this notion in my head that, um, real working writers don't really exist, that there's like a couple famous authors out there and, um, that's it. And that's probably not meant for you. So, uh, you better have a backup plan. So I, I did do that at first. I did. I went to school for a whole different degree um, in psychology, which was really a blessing in disguise because that degree has come um, so handy in my writing and giving me a more in-depth understanding of you know the psychology behind writing a character. Um, so it worked to my advantage, but it's definitely I definitely took the long route to where I am now. And so. Once I graduated uh, my second degree in English and started working in the publishing world, I think the more challenging part about being a creative is just demystifying the process. Like, how do you do this thing? It's not that you can't do it. It's just that it's almost like a secret about how do you do it. Right. And so my entire mission, my business, my everything is centered around helping other people and guiding other people and teaching them everything they need to know about how to be a successful working creative. We are not like magical unicorns. We do exist. (laughs) You know, like you can be a working author or a working artist or whatever that looks like for you. Um, And you can make money doing it. You can make a living doing it. You can support your family doing it. And so I think those limiting beliefs about uh, if you're a writer or you're a creative that you, that it's not really a career, that it always has to be a side hustle is something we're just told. And I, and at this point, I'm not even really sure why we're told that anymore. I feel like we just don't create space for creatives or like value what they bring to society um, in like a monetary way. Yeah, that's so true. And I think a lot of entrepreneurs and people in my audience can definitely resonate with that just because the things that we want to do, oftentimes they seem crazy and far-fetched. And, you know, you think back to when you're a kid and you have all these dreams, you want to be an astronaut or a firefighter or a race car driver. And then at some point it turns into, oh, that's not realistic. You know, you need to be an accountant or be an attorney or whatever, or like study finance or whatever. So I I felt the same way as well. You know, I can't remember at what age I stopped drawing or doing art stuff, you know, it just kind of ended. 
and I stopped drawing in the margins and, you know, I just started focusing on my degree and reading books that I had to read for school, you know? So really cool to just hear your story of how you said you got to demystify that because so many things that people say are not possible. We let that stop us, even though of course it's not possible to that person because they went down that route that we don't want to go. You know, they went down that accounting yeah. career or whatever, whatever it is. I'm not just talking down on accountants. My girlfriend's an accountant, but still I'm like, <laughs> not for me, you know? <laughs> yeah. Well, I think, I think it's about trying to keep your kids safe and us trying yeah. to keep ourselves safe because truthfully, I wanted to be a marine biologist. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that was like my real dream. Um, you know, in the some way that in the same way that some kids, like you said, dream about becoming astronauts. But I was really convinced by a lot of people that there are like five marine biologists. And that's not in true. The world. <laughs> <laughs> like a lot of them. And I definitely could have done that if I wanted to. But again, I think people just push you to do safe things where there's like definitely a job or right. you don't have to go to school for eight, 12 years or, you know, and the safe way doesn't always pay off. Like I worked a lot of safe jobs and made, you know, the 40, $50,000 a year and worked nine to five and I was tired and I was stressed, but I had insurance. Right. And like, yeah. <laughs> was it worth it? No, this way better. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's funny. Cause I mean, I feel the same way in real estate. Like there was, there was so much uncertainty. I just shared this recently where people are motivated now. Cause like I have the $13,000 weeks or, you know, like a 20 K deal or whatever, but I threw in there, I made people understand there were several zero commission months. Like I worked trying to figure things out, made no money, still had bills come in, you know, like, so it seems like now I've cracked the code and I'm in this place where so many people want to be, but you and I had to step through that fire, you know, of the uncertainty and no more benefits and, and going on our own. Cause that's what keeps people comfortable is, oh, I've got benefits and good insurance and dental plan or whatever. Like now, I mean, I got to pay a little more for my, I don't even have dental insurance right now. I don't know if I should or whatever, but still figuring that out, you know, yeah. and the people who are safe, they're still stuck making 50, $60,000 a year having to drive. I mean, a lot of stuff's remote, obviously with everything going on, but I mean, they're probably going back pretty soon or doing some kind of like alternate schedule. You come in one week, take a week from home, that kind of thing. So they're still having to go through these inconveniences because the world is still in that place where they feel like you have to come into the office in many cases to mm -hmm. be productive. Like you can't do this from home. And there's a lot of myths that have been broken. I think lately, just of being able to be productive remotely, being able to start your own business and actually thrive. So I love that you said, you know, you're, you obviously have broken past all of that and you're seeing way better success than just the 40 K a year job where you're stuck there nine to five and you're tired and you're stressed and you're not even excited about what you do, you know? Right. I mean, I think it's about happiness too, you know, sure. and on the podcast that we met on, we had um, such a great conversation about mindset. And I think the one thing I've learned about being an entrepreneur is that to be happy, you have to go through a lot of internal work and internal excavation that's going to make you feel real unhappy for a little while. <laughs> right. um, but it's super worth it because, you know, one of the, even maybe the only reason that people don't become um, entrepreneurs or they don't um, go after that big thing, that big dream that they actually really want is because there's a lot of fear and doubt. There's a lot of self doubt embedded in people. And so for me, learning and for you too, I'm sure like you have to go through this process where you learn so much about yourself and believe in what you're capable of. You know, I tell the authors that I work with all the time that everybody else is only going to believe in your work as much as you believe in it. And in that same vein, like everybody else is only going to believe in you as much as you believe in you. And so getting to a place where you're comfortable with that type of self-worth and that type of um, belief in your own ability and your own potential takes a lot of real work. But that work is what has opened up so much opportunity for me and has opened up all of my, it's helped me see uh, what I'm capable of doing. And then I can take on bigger projects because I know that I can pull them off now. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so there's just so much that goes into like being an entrepreneur or just uh, going after that dream job that you want. And it For all sure. starts here in your mind. 
It all does. There's so much. I think what you said there is super important. The internal work, mm-hmm. that's what it is. I mean, I actually just posted this the other day is like your business can only grow to the extent that you do. Cause mm-hmm. if you're hitting a plateau, chances are maybe you stop learning or trying new classes or joining, you know, you haven't joined a mastermind. Maybe you're gotten around other people who are in a similar place or higher than you. Um, and so that, that just rang so true to me that whenever you're stuck, you need to get to the next level. You need a breakthrough. You need that conversation with somebody who has achieved those things that you want to do. And so same thing with me, I actually, I don't know if I mentioned this on that show that we met on, but I moved from Texas to Colorado like a month ago, (laughs) like right when we met was like a day, like the next day after I moved in, I like went to a WeWork to, to do that show. And so many people were like, oh, you can't do real estate from another state and it's not possible. And I'm like, yeah, it is. I still have deals closing. People don't even know in most cases that I'm not there anymore, but I'm starting to kind of let on a little bit like, hey, I have a team, they'll take care of you, blah, blah, blah. But because I've seen other people and I've in the internet enables this a lot as well. You can kind of follow people who've done it, learn what they do, take their courses, maybe even pay them to, to coach or mentor you. And mm-hmm. you can you can do these things that people still think are impossible. And then you become that shining beacon of hope and light to others who thought it was impossible, but now they see that it is possible. Yeah. I had a mentor once tell me um, to surround yourself with people who are better than you. Yeah. And like, but when she said it, it felt so jarring. I was like, excuse me. <laughs> like, what? I'm not good. <laughs> but I think once you like humble yourself and realize the message inside of that. It was such an important piece of advice because it really made me look around and think like, oh, I actually ha- have to ask for help. And I yeah. actually need to seek out people who are doing better than me and kind of pick apart what are they doing and how can I do that, but add my own flavor to it. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and you mentioned masterminds and I think that like everybody should join masterminds just in life. Like you know, just for anything that you want to do. I think having a mastermind group is so helpful. How do you feel about them? Yeah, I love them. I mean, I, I'm going actually in a couple of weeks here. And of course, this is going to air after I probably go. But still, <laughs> as of the time of this recording in a few weeks in May, I'm going to like a mastermind real estate event, like okay. retreat type thing. And I'm flying out to Oregon and there's going to be a group of like 15 Um, high level entrepreneurs and and mainly in the real estate space, you know, as agents or investors. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly why I'm getting out there because I need to be in the same room as people who are way wealthier than me, smarter than me, um, maybe more giving than me, you know, just seeing like the abundance and feeling that and being like, wow, this person gave away a million dollars last year. How much money are they generating in value? Like, you know, I just see that inspiration. And so I find so much value in getting around people that are where I want to be. And Mm -hmm. like you mentioned there, what your mentor, what your coach had told you before getting around smarter people than you and better people than you in a way, because it sounds jarring. Like you said, like, no, I want to be the smartest person in my circle. But then again, you're not going to be learning or growing. If, if you're the smartest person, chances are, I mean, you may see this. I see it all the time. People are always asking me for help and asking me questions. And it's a little annoying sometimes where it's like, oh my gosh, they're asking me all these things. You could just Google. I need to go talk to some people who are way ahead that value my time. Like where we only ask each other the questions that we really know, like we can help each other with, not the basic stuff. Like Chris, how do you start a podcast? What kind of mic do you have? I'm like, oh my gosh, watch three YouTube videos. Like I did and just order one, you know? Yes. 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 So do, you, do you have, are you in a couple of masterminds like, or do you just try to mastermind as I'm using that as a verb air quotes here? <laughs> yeah. So I not currently right now I'm in the process of planning and executing this giant writer's conference. So I wouldn't I be, able, yeah. yeah, I wouldn't be able to um, give myself to a mastermind right now, but I have been in many, many writers, masterminds, business masterminds. I've run a couple of masterminds too, which was a really cool experience on the other side. Um, in my world, you know, one of the biggest complaints that, or frustrations, I should say that writers have is that they can't write. <laughs> <laughs> and so I have found myself running a lot of masterminds just that, um, get people on a schedule for writing and then like mm-hmm. a safe space for people to come and talk about what they're working on with each other. Um, but with guidelines and limits and in a place where we can learn, um, 
But yeah, I just think that they're so important. I think it's so important just to get outside of your head and have a group of people where you can kind of cultivate new understandings about what you're doing and get new perspectives. I mean, sometimes I feel like I'm going to enter a mastermind and maybe I won't learn anything, but that never happens. (laughs) You know, I always go into it kind of doubtful sometimes. Um, But then, you know, one person in the group will have a perspective I never saw coming and it'll just change everything for me. Um, And I think it's like those little moments of magic that really, they plant a seed inside of you that grows and changes maybe something you're doing in your business. Um, You just never know what's going to come out of a conversation with a group of motivated people who are at least like-minded in in maybe your entrepreneurial venture or in your profession or whatever it might be. Yeah. Those little magical moments, like you said, that that's been the biggest takeaway for me because you, we're all stuck in our own way in a way, like, sure, we're learning. We have a little breakthrough when we read something in a book that's like, Ooh, this is a great quote that it seems obvious, but just the way it's written maybe stands out a little more. And same thing when you're having these little meetings with people who are like-minded, maybe even in different businesses and industries. Like I had that in Houston when I was back in Texas, I had people from all different industries and we just wanted to get better. Mm-hmm. And it was interesting to hear like how they handled a similar problem in their business. That's like totally unrelated from mine. And it gave me that perspective of maybe if I was just talking to real estate only people, we wouldn't have thought of that. But because right. I talked to someone in like the dry cleaning space they were able to tell us something about like how they wash and fold laundry or whatever and do delivery logistically like that I could apply in my own business. Whatever the example is, uh, there's so much cross collaboration that can happen and it plants that little seed where you write stuff down. Like I'll, I'll read through my journal. Sometimes I'll flip back and look like two months ago. What was I thinking about? What problems were I, was I stuck on? Am I still stuck on those? Have I solved them? And it's always exciting to see like, oh my gosh, those things that I kind of started as an idea from a mastermind or a call, I've actually implemented them and it's resulted in an increase in my business or whatever the case is. So I love what you said there about those uh, magic moments. Yeah. And not to be too much of a writing coach, but I just like cannot harp enough on the importance of journaling like that, you know, just random um, like brain dumps or just recording the things that you're thinking about or the ideas that you have just making notes. I can't tell you how many times I like wrote something down. I wasn't even planning on in my head and that became like the next big thing for me or like a huge project or turned into something so much larger. I love that. Um, I'm I'm just trying to flip through and just see like, so the earliest thing in this notebook is from the 12th of February and we're recording this on April 20th. And so like I have, a, I had a vision of my current business and my future business. And honestly, everything on the future business is already in motion from like the, the seed of the idea here, you know, referral agents who can handle all the transactions. I can give them all my business and they run it from A to Z paying people hourly to do my tasks for me. Like having my commissions direct deposited and just wired to me. Like those were things that I was like, you know, it would be nice to have these things. This is what I would like in my business. Mm -hmm. And just two months later, they have all happened because I was intentional about it. So everyone listening, really be sure to journal, get those ideas out of your head, get them on paper. I know, I know as a writer, you're probably more a fan of like real pen and paper instead of like (laughs) digital. Is that the case? (laughs) Yes and no. I go back and forth for different things. So okay. Yeah. Do you use any tools like Evernote for taking notes digitally? So I used to use Evernote like in the beginning of my business, actually. Um, now I'm just, I just sloppily text myself notes. <laughs> okay. I, I email myself notes sometimes. And then I add it into Asana. If you've ever heard of a- Asana, A-S-A-N-A.com, it mm-hmm. kind of ends up becoming a checklist. So it's like, ooh, this idea that I have that I emailed to myself, now it's on a checklist for me to kind of have on my radar, you know? Right. But definitely is like the most cliche writer as I can be. I definitely have separate uh, notebooks and journals for separate types of ideas. Very cool. Very cool. Um, I'm like way too type A for my own good. So <laughs> see everything working. goes in here where it's like, I have an idea. I write it down. I take notes yeah. from a clubhouse call. It goes here. So uh, that's, that's cool that you have separate, I guess it helps you get in that frame of thought of, okay, this is about this book that I'm writing. I'm only going to write about that. 
Yeah. It's really important for me to stay in one place. Like I have, um, a specific journal, like exactly like you said, for this book I'm working on. Um, I have a specific journal for work stuff. Um, I have a specific journal for like processing personal things, personal growth stuff, Mm -hmm. um, and so on. So for me, it helps me compartmentalize and focus on exactly what I want to kind of cultivate in that session when I'm journaling. Um, it's important to me that I keep creativity kind of in this sacred space. And so it needs its own little book that I write in. It needs like, I need my own little spot in the house where I go. Um, That's just me. But for me, it helps me, it helps me stay focused. It helps me stay on task, but it also helps remind me that I think as business owners, it's a really common struggle to sit down, want to work on your own project or work on something that really might not have anything to do with work. And then your brain just like gets away from you and you're like, oh yeah, but I have like 14 things left on my to-do list today. Or I know somebody probably emailed me and I want to know what they said, you know, or I did I post today, you know, you have all of these things because you feel like you have to keep up. Um, so creating sacred space that's like this book in this spot for me helps me shut that off. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I guess the way I would think of that is almost like different Word document files, right? Like you, I used to take notes in Word, I think back in college and I'd open it up like this is my marketing <laughs> class notes for quarter one or however I would separate it. And that way I could actually keep my thoughts. It wasn't like, these are all my notes for every class in one word document that I have a hard time finding. It's like, no, this is my marketing 201 class. And these are all my marketing notes. And then next, it's kind of hard to do that for calculus. I don't think I could really type my notes because you had to write so much, which I was upset about because I like to type more. Um, But that's very helpful just to have different journals for different thoughts that you're working on or projects in a way. Um, and having that dedicated space, because you're right that there's so many distractions and, oh, I forgot to do this. And it's like the computer with 50 tabs open, it's going to be super slow. And you probably have like 10 of the same tab open, right? I, I, I do that all the time. I'm like, email, email, email. Oh, I've got five tabs with the Gmail tab open. Like I only need one. What am I doing? Chris, focus on, you know, or you open something. This might, Does this ever happen to you where you like open something and you're like, what was I even going to do in the first place? constantly <laughs> do you have or what, any tips for focusing like when you're doing your writing do you have like a time block or you do set a timer yes so I do meticulously like time block my days um in my planner but the you know this is gonna sound super strange but sometimes like the less I focus on work the more productive I am hmm, so I have yeah I'm pretty strict with my routine so you know in the mornings I when I get up, I make tea, let the dogs out, all that normal stuff. But then I do set aside time for reading and journaling that has nothing to do with work. Um, and then like a little bit of movement and then breakfast, and then I go to work. And I find that when I'm super busy at work, sometimes my brain wants to skip all of that and just kind of get up and sit down at my computer, which I've right. done many <laughs> occasions. Yep. But interestingly, those days where I ignore that morning routine and I just go straight to work, are the worst days that I have, you know, I feel disorganized. I work slowly. Um, I maybe don't get things done the way that I would have, um, like more creatively or more efficiently, but the days that I do take those little times throughout the day that I need, like that morning time. And then I have another, um, time blocked out for that sort of thing in the afternoon, um, are the days I'm way more productive you know, I, it's really easy to sit down and just kind of try and like continuously work for hours and hours and hours and hours, especially when it's your own business and you're so committed to it. But I really find that taking small breaks throughout the day to do something for yourself, something that has to do with like personal growth or creativity helps me be so much more productive. Um, cause when I go back, I'm refreshed. I have better ideas. I'm quicker. I'm more efficient. And then I get a lot done in like two hours and then I take another break. Yeah. Have you read the book or listened on Audible to uh, Deep Work by Cal Newport? No, I've never even heard of it. Yeah. So I've I've heard him on a couple of interviews, I think, on YouTube or podcasts. And I finally just had an extra credit in Audible and, and bought it and listened to it. I probably listened to it in like three days. It's probably six or seven hours long. And it talks about going very, very deep. And it talks a lot about writers who would you know get a cabin in the woods or even Bill Gates. Like he was known for leaving and having this disconnecting time, no internet, you know, 
mm-hmm. uh, just textbooks and like a notepad to learn and figure out how to grow the business and all without any distractions. And it even mentioned one other writer who had like a crazy deadline, you know, he signed something and he had to get the first draft done in, I don't know, a week or two. And he literally booked a flight to Japan to write on the plane and then like literally got on the plane to come back. Like he just did that to force himself, you know, to be 30,000 feet up in the air, no distractions, no internet. And he hammered out the first draft of that book. And, um, what you mentioned there too, I feel the same way. If I skip my morning routine or I have a r- to rush to do something, you know, like a friend just visited us in Colorado and I had to drop her off to the airport like super early and it kind of cut my routine short where I didn't do my reading. I didn't get to finish my journal and I just felt like scattered versus doing that routine where you're, you get the blood moving, you do a couple like jumping jacks or, you know, cardio, whatever. I feel like I'm way more productive as well those days than if I just wake up and I sit at my computer and try to start answering emails or something like that. I think it's so interesting. These writers, I hear those stories all the time. Like, for example, like Neil Gaiman has his own like writing den that he like walks off his property into this beautiful into forest, den. <laughs> you know, this little den to write all day. Or like these people who take these trips and go to the cabin in the woods. Yeah. And I have tried this multiple times yeah. and every time <laughs> it has been an abject failure Um, I don't know if it's because I like run a business from home, but every time I try to go outside of where I normally write, oh man, like I went to Brooklyn one time for a week and I was like, I'm just going to book this Airbnb. I'm just going to stay here by myself. I like took care of this woman's cat. I was like, this is going to be great. Nobody's going to bother me. I'm just going to write all week. I wrote for like five minutes the first day. And then I like laid on the couch and like ate junk food and watched movies for (laughs) did nothing. And I have had that experience time and time again, because I keep, I have this like romanticized idea in my head about this big, yeah, yeah, this creative escape and this retreat where I'm going to get all this stuff done. But the reality is like in 2020, I sat down for eight weeks and like took a break from work in this spot and wrote a novel. If I had gone to a cabin, there's no chance that would have happened. So (laughs) I wish I was like those people, but mm -mm. (laughs) no, I've tried this too. And I guess even when I think back to college, when I went to the library and I try to find a good spot to study and I was just super Mm -hmm. distracted, like I'd have to have earplugs. I couldn't hear any conversations because like I'd be listening to those instead of reading and reading the same paragraph five times. I don't know. It was just so distracting and difficult. Yeah. Force myself to read stuff that I already didn't really feel like reading. For example, like business law. Oh my gosh. So boring. (laughs) Like the, the law professor actually wrote that book and it had typos. It was just brutal to get through no pictures or anything. (laughs) I'm like, Oh, I have to force myself to read this, but I, I never really quite found that good spot, I guess, back then. And now this is kind of my sacred space, my office, I can close the door. Pets are locked away. So I do agree that if you find that, or if you create that space for yourself. It's consistent. You know, it's your little retreat from your, the rest of your house for you to get work done. Uh, And also I think another thing, if you're going on a destination place to try to get work done, I would want to go explore, you know, I I wouldn't want to be stuck in an Airbnb in a cool place that I could just go down the street and have bars and restaurants and things to do, you know, so that may be a distraction. So I don't know, whoever's listening, just, you got to find that place for yourself or create that place experiment you know maybe the cabin in the woods works better for some people than others I don't know yeah I think it works for some people but I agree with you 100% when I was in New York all I did was like go to museums I was like I have to go to the MoMA obviously and then I was like oh I'm tired tomorrow (laughs) I gotta have halal guys and now you're really tired it's like 2,000 calorie meal or whatever (laughs) right yeah just figuring it out but I mean there's so much um self-development and growth that happens for entrepreneurs in general like gosh, that's the biggest challenge for me. I mean, I'm sure anyone else who's quit their job, they felt this where you have complete control of your day and time Mm -hmm. and figuring out what you need to do to, to maximize the output without having to work all the time is like, no one's there to tell you what to do. You know, like Mm -hmm. how many pages do you write? How long do you write for? When do you stop? What what do you do on your breaks? You know, those are all things that you got to kind of figure out on your own. And I think that being an entrepreneur like breaks down some myths that we have about what working looks like too. Um, You know, I, if you're in an office and you work for a boss, you don't have anything else to worry about. Like you go to your cubicle and you work for eight hours, 
but working from home for me, like space is so important to me um, and the way my space feels and does it help me be productive and like functionality is really important too. So some of my work day is spent on those things or is spent on, like you said, my own personal growth. Like I consider all of that important to my work. And I, and I do think that if like regular corporate jobs considered those things as important to their work, that their employees would be much more productive and creative and feel more valued. You know, you hear a lot about company companies like Google and places like that, incorporating these kinds of ideas. And then the payoff is enormous. Um, And so I think it's important that as entrepreneurs, that we treat our days the same way and that we really think about like, what does vitality mean? What does it mean to be a highly productive, creative person without burning out? How can being an entrepreneur be like an act of nourishment for yourself and not burnout? Um, Because I think I always feel terrible, like so many new business owners go through figuring out what it means to not burn out. And it's because they were taught through their corporate jobs to just like work, 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 and like do it as hard as you can. And that's how you make it. And that's not true. (laughs) Yeah, that's so true. I mean, exactly what you just said. I totally resonate with that. And then on the other side is the other problem. I've spoken about this, I think recently on live videos and whatnot, like I have the problem where I have so much time because I've automated so many things and I have like VAs doing stuff while I'm sleeping, virtual (laughs) assistants for those listening that I feel guilty that I'm not working more, but the checks are still rolling in and I'm still making money. And I'm like, I'm having my best year ever. So I'm like, am I getting lazy? Am I going to lose it all in a few months? Or have I figured it out where I now have the lifestyle business? I I don't know. I'm kind of experimenting. Do you ever have those days where you're like, I have no appointments today. What do I work on? Or do you know what you need to work on? I'm just kind of curious for myself too. So I go through the entrepreneur guilt too. (laughs) Um, I should be doing something now, but I'm watching Netflix. Yeah. (laughs) Well, I think there's two different kinds. There's that kind. There's the, well, I'm really blowing off today and I shouldn't be doing this guilt. (laughs) Right. Um, And that's not always a bad thing. But the other guilt is, I think what you're saying, like when you do elevate and so much of your work is automated and you have this time to yourself and feeling like I'm not earning what I'm making. For me, those are just moments to say like, okay, what is the thing that I should be doing? Cause I obviously don't know what it is. Like if somebody, who, yeah. yeah, if somebody who does what I do at a higher level, um, I just not, I'm just not privy yet to what those things are. So that's become, that then becomes like an investigation. So I, you know, for me replacing that guilt with kind of that investigative mindset of like, okay, this means it's just time for me to find Uh, what that next level means. And there have been times in my business, like, especially in the beginning when it was very small. And then when, you know, when you're not making any money and you're just trying to figure it out where you can see those leap. And when you know that you've like gotten to the next level of your business and you feel so proud of that. And then there's like a lot of work to do because you're like, okay, now I'm finally here. So now I need to do A, B, and C so I can get to this next. But sometimes when you get to the point where you're making a sufficient salary a year, and you hit those points, you're like, oh, wait a minute, but what is, I don't know what the next step is. Like, I don't know what this means. Mm -hmm. And so that's when you have to, like I said earlier, find people who just know better than you um, to figure that out. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. I like how you said you go to that investigative mode because I have heard that we, you know, we're going to hit a ceiling in our business and it's like the plateau that I mentioned, your, our business can only grow to the extent that we do. And to grow, we need to network with other people who have gotten to that next level and find out what are the things that they they're doing. And of course it's, there's so many things you could do and people have different strategies. I'm just thinking about even for me in real estate, it's like I could go all in on social media or I could invest in cold callers to like call expired listings, or I could also do, you know, there's so many things you could do that I guess it just takes a little bit of trial and error to network and find what other people are doing, but also make sure that aligns with what you want to do. Cause if someone who's on the next level is cold calling for five hours a day, that's not really my cup of tea. And I don't feel like getting a bunch of rejections all day. Cause that drains me versus having yeah. awesome conversations with people who want to talk with me. And I feel way more lit up afterwards. So being an investigator, I think in your life, that's, that's how we get to the next level and how we even figure out what we want to do in the first place. Right. And I think I like what you said about um, 
like doing what resonates with you. Cause I really hate to see entrepreneurs who are like pushing themselves to do things that they hate to do. And I was definitely one of those people. I really felt like I needed to not only master social media, but then also just be on top of it all the time and like hire a team. And like, you know, for me in a creative field, that kind of visual was so important. But I hate it. <laughs> like, hate it, hate it, hate it. it makes I think you so like the book Deep Work because it talks about getting rid of social media entirely because it's just distraction. Yeah, and it doesn't out. really help you as a writer, especially. So, sorry for interrupting. I just wanted to say. No. no, no, no. You're so right, and I need to read that because it. Well, it doesn't help. It doesn't help for a lot of ways. Unless you're a product based business, there's not mm-hmm. really a super huge reason to be on social media. Unless your goal is to like be an influencer, and like I'm past that. (laughs) Um, but I went off social media in 2020 for six months and then had the best year of my business. Wow. And so it just affirmed for me that this, like I need to pursue what I instinctually know is for me Mm -hmm. and to let go of things that drain me, like you said, or that feel unnatural to me, or just feel unnatural to my personality. You know, I think, part of being an entrepreneur is shaping a business around who you are and making it, you know, a comfortable fit for yourself instead of trying to force yourself into what you think other people want you to be or who you should be. Because especially if you are selling services, you are ultimately selling yourself to people. And so I get kind of like icky feeling when that becomes, when that feels like I'm selling myself, if I can just show up authentically and do the things that feel good to me, then people will feel that people will understand that. And then I will attract people who I want to work with. But if I'm forcing myself to be on social media or to fit an image or to like constantly be rebranding and thinking about how I'm presenting myself, I'm only attracting other people who are inauthentic, who don't know what they want. If I don't even know what I want. Yeah, that makes so much sense. There's a there's an entrepreneur I've followed for a while and he talks about that where his wife saw success from blogging in in the business that they had created and he thought that he was going to have to be a blogger and he just could never get himself to do it and he didn't like writing and it just seemed like so much work and then he realized that YouTube was his channel of preference and like he can easily record something for 30 minutes or an hour like nonstop on the fly and do a good job and build an audience that, and it resonated with them. And he's over 150,000 subscribers and and counting at this point. And like, that was his true authentic self. And so it takes a little bit of that experimentation. Um, But again, like just one more thing from that book, Deep Work that I, and it's just fresh on my mind because I just listened to it like for two hours or something yesterday. Mm -hmm. It was kind of like a slow day and I was just working out and like in this hot tub, cold tub thing that I signed up for. So I had a lot of time to listen to this book and he brought up a good point. That's like, you know, you don't have to be on all the social media stuff, especially say you're a writer is the example he went back to. Is it really going to help to engage with these people? Maybe over three years, you get 2000 more fans who buy your book. That's still not going to move the needle to get on the bestseller status list. Like you've got to be at a way higher level focusing on, going on podcasts, like getting interviewed on news channels, like things like whatever it is for the promotion, instead of these little micro engagements that just take a lot of time, it's very hands-on and it doesn't necessarily move the needle like as much in what it is that you're trying to achieve. Yeah. I think that, um, new entrepreneurs and new authors just, I can only speak to that because it's like my experience. Yeah, that's fine. That's cool. They, jump on this hamster wheel. Like I have so many clients who launch a book and say, and then send me emails that are like, here are my plans for every outlet. And I'm like, no social media. Yeah. (laughs) Start a a podcast. You know, I'm going to start a newsletter. I'm going to start a blog. Here's all my social media handles. And I just think to myself, like, but when are you going to be writing? Right. And <laughs> <laughs> kind of important. Be, yeah. And when are you going to be submitting that writing to agents? How are you going to like, what is your career trajectory? What are you selling? And so I, yeah, I just think it's easy for people to think that that's the answer because we're so lulled into this kind of reality on social media that we're all caught up in. Yeah. Um, but those definitely are not the things that have made my business successful. The things that have made my business successful, first and foremost, is word of mouth um, and just people's ability to spread 
good news and to be happy with um, what you provided with them and for them to share that with their communities and let that kind of that ripple effect build your business. I mean, I know that's a really old school way of thinking, but I, without ever investing in that idea, that's just naturally happened for me over the years. Um, And then also just I think it's, I think it's easier for people to say like, oh, I should definitely do social media marketing. But the truth is in any business, what you need to be doing is pursuing those bigger marketing opportunities that you'll probably get rejected for in the beginning and like big features and articles and interviews and getting in front of people who you don't think are in within your reach, but on your journey and pursuing those people who you don't think are within your reach, you're going to meet a whole bunch of people who are going to help you along the way. And none of that work has anything to do with social media. Like, sure, you can throw up a post and be like, this exciting thing happened to me and let people celebrate you for it. Um, But in terms of actual exposure and growth for your business, all of that really comes from doing like the scary things, not the simple posting on Instagram. Yeah, that's so true. And I I think about examples like Spanx where... I guess Sarah Blakely got, you know, Oprah loved the product and like had her on and that blew up her business. And so everyone thinks about that moment of like getting on Shark Tank or being interviewed by Oprah as what gets you there when really it's a series of like all those little podcasts that you jumped on and the interviews that you did that may, you know, maybe got you that introduction to somebody who then knew Oprah. It's crazy what happens, but you can't just try to shoot all the way for... I mean, shoot for the stars for sure. Like shoot for those top places. But like you said, those are probably a little more difficult to get right off the bat. But as you start to develop that track record of, look, I've been on a hundred things. I've been featured on Forbes and entrepreneur and, and whatever. That's when you start to get more of that credibility to kind of not get overlooked from those higher public ed- pu- publications or podcasts. So I'm slowly working my way up there as well. I'm like, I'm interviewing bigger guests and then I'm getting on more shows and eventually I'd love to get on some huge shows that I first started listening to before I even started my own podcast. So that's kind of the circle of uh, entrepreneurship. Yeah. And I think one thing I want to like tell your listeners too, is that um, for creatives, especially, Mm -hmm. I think it's scary, you know, I mean, it's scary for me. Like I am a weird introverted writer. I get it. Okay. (laughs) Um, I'm talking on a podcast. (laughs) I, um, when I started my business, uh, I got invited to do some speaking engagements and I thought I was going to actually die. Like I didn't, you know, I just didn't think I could make it. I was like, well, I'm not going to be able to do this. I'm not gonna be able to run a business. I'm never going to be able to talk in front of people. And the first couple of times I did it, I genuinely don't even remember it. I just kind of like forced myself, got up there, blacked out, said some things, then it was over. Mm-hmm. Um, and it went okay. <laughs> and it normally does go okay. <laughs> yes. Exactly. But so I think for a lot of people who have really big and important ideas or creative ideas or things that, you know, would affect other people that should be out in the world, they might also be people who are just really scared of that kind of thing. And I just want to tell them that I get it. (laughs) Um, I feel it 100%. Eight years later into this business, I still feel it. But that's part of my work. That's part of my personal growth. That's part of something I've had to spend so much time exploring and finding coaching on and being in masterminds. I was in a a mastermind for women doing speaking engagements at one point because I was like, I just need to get better at this. Mm -hmm. And then things started to turn around. And then people started asking me to come speak because they had seen me speak at something else. And that switch is like worth all of the kind of panic (laughs) that I went through for years. Um, so I just want like shy people, introverted people, creative people to know that this is still a possibility that, uh, owning, running a business and reaching a larger audience is still something you can do. And I've learned that, um, part of my ability to do that is being in control of the situation. So like when I do speaking engagements, I'm not a person that can like stand at a podium and talk at a group of people. Mm -hmm. I genuinely make everybody sit down and like form a circle. Like even if there's 50 of you, we'll make concentric rings. Cause I like to sit down with people and like have a conversation um, and create a more intimate atmosphere. And the moment that I do that and I exercise that sense of control over the situation, it puts me at ease. It puts the people I'm talking to at ease and it creates um, 
a situation that I'm comfortable with. And I, and so I think sometimes people don't know that they, you can do that. You know, like if somebody's paying you to come speak somewhere, they expect you to deliver like your unique message and yourself. And so if that's part of it, that's part of it. And I think that it's just important for, for introverted people to remember that. Cause I think a lot of people don't pursue their businesses because of that. Yeah, that's so true. I, I interviewed someone recently. I think it was um, my friend Owais Koreshi, for anyone who's listened to that episode, and he mentioned something because he was extremely introverted. Like the first time I interviewed him on my show, he came on twice. Like he kept messing up as soon as he knew the camera was on, like he was messing up and like telling me like, okay, we got to cut that out, restart this. It was like the, the hardest thing to edit. But the second time it was powerful and authentic. And he was like coming from a place of contribution. And I think he told me something along the lines of like, every time he's freaking out or feeling nervous, he thinks about how he's doing this for his audience or like he's doing this to help. He's coming from a place of service. Mm-hmm. So for anyone who's in the audience, who's afraid of getting that podcast started or writing that book or what people are going to think or doing a Facebook live video, just think about that. I mean, someone out there, you know, needs your message. They need to hear what you have to say. They want to hear what your offer is. And maybe they need your course that you, that you have inside of you that maybe you're afraid to to put out there, but just do it. And like you mentioned, as soon as you start to do those things that are difficult, they become less difficult because you, you start to get used to it. We're all scared of stuff we've never tried before. And then you do it and you're like, okay, this isn't too bad. Let me do it again. And now you're a speaker. I don't know if you have it on your LinkedIn or anything. Yeah, I'm sure it's like author, writer, speaker. <laughs> <laughs> like you actually embrace and that identity after you start to prove to yourself that you can do it. Yeah. I mean, I, I do it sparingly, <laughs> but I yeah. do it. somebody once said to me, um, you know, everybody that's here came to hear what you have to say. And cool. it's such an obvious statement. It's such a simple thing to say, but I was like, oh yeah, duh. Like right. they're not thinking of, like, nobody is in that audience waiting to criticize you. Like nobody sitting there is thinking like, wow, I can't wait till she gets on stage so I can like judge her, you know, right. like that's I our fear. Hear you. Right. That's our fear is that they're not going to like something about us or we're not going to say something the right way. But really, people just want connection. They just want to hear your story. They just want to connect with um, who you are and what you've been through and see a little bit of themselves inside you. And so sometimes the best thing to do is just call it out. Like there have been plenty of times where I've gone to speak at something. I mean, I one time I, when I launched my first book, we had this big party. Um, it was being adapted for, uh, the stage at the Carnegie. And so I had to get up and speak to these people. And the moment I stood up there, I was like, wow, I'm going to pee my pants. Like I'm literally <laughs> so panicked. I like can't control my body. And then I thought to myself, like all of these people came here because they were touched by something you said, you know, this work that you put out into the world, this thing that you wrote. And I just, the first thing I said was like, wow, I'm so incredibly nervous. I'm shaking. And so like, please excuse my voice. People probably like started like laughing because yes. they can relate. Like everyone in that audience would probably feel equally as nervous to stand up and have to be speaking on the spot. Yeah. They just clapped as like a moment of support. That's and awesome. Yeah. Sometimes it's just a really beautiful thing to be vulnerable. Like you don't have to get up and be this expectation you have in your mind of something, somebody super powerful or somebody who's just going to like deliver this, you know, roaring keynote. Sometimes you can just get up and be like, wow, I'm nervous, but like, here are the things I want to share with you. And people love it. Yeah. Cause they can relate to that and you feel real and authentic and not so polished. And I always talk about authenticity and, you know, you'll find your voice as you start to do something more and, the best feeling to me, and I'm sure you had this as well, is when people reach out maybe to a post that you make or a piece of content that you write or share. And they're like, oh my gosh, I resonated with that so much. Like I felt the same way when I quit my job and the uncertainty. And it's kind of cool and reassuring because that's something that other people think too. It's not, we all have unique thoughts and ideas, but a lot of the, the thoughts are similar as well, or at least kind of along the same vein. And so as soon as you start sharing that, a lot of people do resonate with that. And they're like, oh my gosh, that's exactly like you took the words off my lips or whatever. Right. And it just takes someone to, to take that step and maybe just accept that you will be that person to carry out that message and that, that work. So hopefully there's some people in the audience who maybe they've got some ideas within them, books, podcasts, audio books, anything like that, that are going to come here to fruition very soon. 
because they know that they need to share their message with someone who needs to hear it. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to just quickly promote one of my clients because we just did her book launch last weekend, but yeah. uh, I learned so much from the people I work with. I mean, like I have people come to me all the time with different book ideas and I have to learn their perspective and these unique ideas that they have. So she wrote a book, it's called the miseducation of empathy. And she wrote this book about empathy that reteaches the idea of empathy and what it's actually supposed to be. Her whole thing is about, um, you know, we're taught to put yourself in someone else's shoes, but the whole book really says like to practice real empathy and connection, you have to keep yourself in your own shoes. Um, because like you were saying, her point is that thoughts generalize across gender, race, class, economics. Um, it's the way that we feel about those thoughts that cause different behaviors. And so I don't need to understand why you act a certain way, but I can understand what you think about something. And so once we understand like why a person thinks something about the way that the way that they think about something, we can understand how they feel about something. And so, you know, that's to say that if you feel nervous about something, it's because you think I can't do this or uh, they're not going to like me or, you know, something, or I'm not enough, something similar to that. And everybody has had those same thoughts. Everybody can feel those same things. So, you know, that's really the true meaning of empathy. Um, And so I think when we keep that in mind, it's just easier to connect with other people. Yeah, that's powerful. And I guess it is difficult to know exactly why someone does something because we we're not in their shoes. We are in our own shoes. We are all a sum of our own individual experiences, right? Like I can't relate to someone who's been, who's born into like a homeless camp, for example, because like I had a nice family that did all these things, but I also can't relate to the little rich kid. That's like, I remember (laughs) me being in real estate. One of the real estate agents was like, I had this like European family come to my open house and the little kid's like, mommy, this is like, this is way smaller than my other room. And it's like a mansion. (laughs) Like I can't relate to that either. So it's funny because we're all just, we're from different backgrounds, different experiences. Uh, Some had harder hardships than others, I guess. And some have had more fortunate beginnings as well. And so we just need to understand um, that we can just do the best that we can get around people who are hungry to get to that next level and just continue to improve ourselves no matter where we are in life. So thank you for sharing that. And I know we've got a couple minutes left, so I just wanted to open it up. If there's anything that you wanted to share or talk through, and then also where people can find you, feel free to uh, take it away. Well, right now I am preparing to host the, uh, the Entrepreneur Conference. This will air after the conference, but you can still check it out. We'll be doing another one in the future. Um, you can find information about that at theauthorconference.com. But you can find me everywhere at the handle editor Amanda or at my website, amandaphilpelli.com. Um, but yeah, I love to hear from writers and creatives, just what they're working on. I'm a real, um, let's just chat kind of person. <laughs> um, so, you know, I always tell everybody it doesn't, uh, it doesn't cost you anything to encourage an artist. So if there are artists out there that just need kind of a moment of encouragement or just a little conversation, or just want to share what they're doing, like feel free to DM me or email me. I love that kind of thing. That's awesome. And I always think about that. Cause like you see like murals and stuff and like graffiti artists and you have their little Instagram handle. And I'm always wondering, like, I wonder if they're figuring out like, are they, when are they going to make it or when is it going to hit? Cause their art's beautiful or are they already quote unquote successful? And how do you even know? We're we're all going through that, you know, creatives or not. And I kind of argue, think most entrepreneurs are kind of creatives because we're coming up with content. We're coming up with videos. We're creating podcasts, writing books. Mm -hmm. Um, so thank you for that invitation for anyone listening in the audience. I will have all of your show notes, how to spell your last name, everything, (laughs) everything will be in there for them to reach out to you and connect with you. And thank you once again, Amanda, it's been awesome having you on the show and just really inspirational to hear like you can be successful at things, even if others don't think so, or think you need to have a quote unquote safer backup plan. So Mm -hmm. that's definitely an inspiring story of like, making something out of your passion and actually making a living off of it. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for having me. This is such a pleasure. Yeah. Thanks, Amanda. Great connecting with you again. And I look forward to staying in touch. Sounds good. Hey everyone, Chris Bello here. Just wanted to thank you real quick for listening to the show, whether you're listening on podcast or YouTube or wherever it is that you may be listening. 
I uh, wanted to make that quick offer about real estate help. I am in the real estate business. That is my main business and how I make all my income and my living by helping others buy, sell, rent, or invest in real estate across the nation. If you have any questions at all, go to chrisbello.com slash real estate. Again, that is chrisbello.com slash real estate. I'd love to see if I can help you out in my markets. And maybe if you're in a market outside of the ones that I'm focusing on right now, I'd love to connect you with a real estate professional who can help fulfill whatever needs or services that you are requiring. So again, go to chrisbello.com slash real estate. A great thing is when I connect you with a vetted professional, if I'm not able to help you myself, is whenever a transaction closes, I'm actually able to get a referral commission. So that can be a great way of thanking me for my content. It helps to support the show and it helps me to continue to spend time bringing on amazing guests, doing these great interviews, spending a lot of time on creating content and making sure that I can bring you the very best information that you need to grow professionally, emotionally, intelligently, and in every single area. You know, we're all working on getting better at everything. And so my focus and expertise is in real estate. I'd love to be the one to help you again. Uh, if you're not interested in that, no worries at all. Please continue to listen to the show. Make sure you leave a review. It helps so much in getting new followers and sharing the message. And thank you once again for being a listener. I'll catch you on the next episode.